I've been given the opportunity to introduce our, our guest speaker. Um, I was kind of looking over his, his bio that I was given, and I, I almost feel like I need to be putting some kind of like Hall of Fame gold jacket on you. Uh, I mean, you're a first ballot Hall of Famer. I, I, I was going to try and, and memorize some of this, but honestly, I'm just not that smart. So I'm going to read it. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ken Owen was ma is married to his wife, Betty. They have three children, nine grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. As a father of three daughters, I thought I was broke. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> As both a, a bachelor's and a master's from Southeastern University, uh, was the, this, the pastor at First Assembly of God in Greenville, South Carolina for 36 years? Wow. Um, Christian Education Committee, Presbyter of the Potomac District, Presbyter of the South Carolina District, Assistant Superintendent to the South Carolina District, Board of Directors, Southeastern University, uh, and then Presbyter for 28 years. This man has dedicated his life to the Lord uh, and to all of God's children here in South Carolina. So it is my distinct privilege to introduce Pastor Ken Owens. Come on up. Okay. Thank you. What an introduction. It didn't take me very long to pin that because I, uh, I don't really feel comfortable in tooting my own horn. That's kind of against culture today, isn't it? When I grew up, they always said, let somebody else praise you, don't praise yourself. And I find that to be a very good thing to do. But I am delighted to be here. I was thinking back over the years of being a, uh, on the executive leadership team, I served under the last three district superintendents, two of them are now in heaven. And uh, I remember when the set, they purchased this property, I remember the board decision to, this was a good thing to do, and we've kind of followed it, even though I've never been here before. I didn't have the, the pleasure that some of the district brethren have to uh, travel all over the district and see all the churches, everything's happening. But I'm uh, very, very impressed by what I see here and what I feel here. That's the thing that really touches my heart. You know, without the presence, it's just a building, isn't it? But when he comes, he just graces the place and makes it something special. That was wonderful worship time. And I've been uh, interim pastor for the last four months in Seneca. When I got out in the car this morning, and I, my son is with me. He's just uh, come back from Springfield, Holy City, <laughs> and uh, has, is involved. He's now a U.S. missionary. And uh, my phone said 55 minutes to United Assembly. So for the last four months, I've been driving every Sunday morning down to preach for a church that uh, is actually in a ditch and uh, is in need of uh, restoration. And when they asked me to go, they said, all we want you to do is go preach and minister and love on these people. And it doesn't, it doesn't take me that long really to really come to love the people that I minister to. And uh, even though I've, we have a pastor in place now who will be starting in November, who grew up in the church in Greenville and has pastored a couple of, an associate in several places, and uh, I know his family played golf with his dad yesterday. So it's quite a pleasure and an honor to be at this stage of my life and see how the seed that has been planted has grown up. And we have uh, ministers all over the place. In fact, I was talking to one of my associates back in the first church that I pastored in Maryland back in 1970s. And uh, he was telling me, he was preaching for me one Wednesday night. I don't know where I was because I, I don't travel much. I like, to be, I like to be at the home base, but 
he said a couple came in. I never met them before, he said, and they, they brought a sack supper in with them. And it was Wednesday night, and so they opened up their bag, and they began to uh, uh, eat their supper while he was speaking. So he said, I thought afterwards I'd go over and meet them. That's quite unusual. I don't know if I've ever seen that before, but I, I got to know this gentleman. I know him pretty well, but uh, anyway, there was a problem. He had a little problem. His elevator wasn't going all the way to the top. And anyway, he went over and introduced himself, and he, he was going to shake the lady's hand, and she said, I don't touch the opposite sex. Well, praise God. And uh, so he said, uh, if you knew this guy, he, he's a soul winner. And he said, do you know Jesus? And the man said, I am he. <laughs> and honest to goodness, the guy told me later, he said, uh, I found all the apostles here in this little town. I said, really? Where'd you find them? And he began to name the taverns that he found them in. And I said, isn't that something? We were in a building project, and he said, when you get through, we're going to take it over. And uh, one time he said, you don't have to worry about me. He said, I got the devil. He's right here in my wooden leg. And he pecked on it. I don't know how he got that leg, but... Funny things happen in church, don't they? And uh, I've enjoyed the ride. I just kind of have to laugh. But sometimes when he would bring his picture in, it wouldn't let anybody sit in front of him because they said, Jesus can't see. I said, what? You know, I could tell you some more stories. In fact, I have a lot of stories. That somebody said, you ought to write a book. And uh, anyway, it, uh, this is a great, great place to be in life, serving God, and uh, even though retired from pastoring, I'm working harder than I've ever worked in my life. I, I'm here today, this morning, and I'm, I'm speaking to a group of overcomers is the name of the ministry in Greenville. Actually, it is not a, a full gospel. It's uh, if from a church that really frowns on the full gospel. And uh, somehow we are working together. And every once in a while, they put the brakes on us because they don't know whether they could. We don't know about you folks. And if they've been here and seen all you people talking about your pastors being fruity, <laughs> oh, Lord, they would be saying that we have reason to be a little hesitant to give you a free, free ride. But, you know, when those, we've had those guys, they come to our church every once in a while when I was pastoring, and about 40 or 50 of them, and they would sing. They had a choir and an older gentleman that would lead them, and you would look there with doctors in that group, lawyers, wealthy people, all with life-controlling habits. And here's the thing. We know that no program can set a man free. It takes the power of Jesus Christ, and it just breaks your heart to see it. The families that are connected, many of them have lost their family. And uh, last, uh, last month, I spoke there, and one gentleman came forward, and he, I haven't seen a man cry like he cried in, at the altar in that little service, and afterwards, he said, my father's a Pentecostal minister. And he said, the conviction in here tonight, it just, it was so strong. I couldn't help but to respond and to reach out to him. God is still working. He's still on the throne. And he's still sending out missionaries and people, pastors. And it's a privilege to work with them and to have had the opportunities that we've had. To be here on this day is a special day because it, I, have, I appreciate the fact that you're honoring your staff. That's a good thing. I've never known a church to grow and prosper that didn't have that type of relationships within the church where the leadership and the people were on the same page and there was a mutual respect back and forth, not just toward us as pastors, but from the pastor to the people. And it's a wonderful thing 
to see that, and I want to commend you for, for what you're doing today and the, the setup in here. It's, it's very nice to, to have an occasion like this where you can feel a closeness and be near folks around you and worship together and then eat together. I think one of the best things that we do as Pentecostals is eat. <laughs> so we can eat at the drop of the hat and drop the hat ourselves. You know, we love to eat. And uh, some of the best cooks in the world we will find in, in this setting. And my, top, my text is found. I've, I probably would never have preached this message at my church because it may not be appropriate for me to, but I can hear. And if it's not a good text, the only thing you can do is throw a rock at my car as I leave. <laughs> Since I'm a preaching and Pastor Ed will straighten you out when I get through. If I do anything wrong, I, I have faith in him. Let me just say this about him. Uh, I don't know him as well as I would like to because, but we've, we've been in meetings together and I've heard him talk about you a lot. And I'm going to tell you, I want you to know, he represents you well. In fact, most pastors build their church up and when, if I have occasion to go there, occasionally the hype is bigger than the church. But I want to say he is, he is so excited and speaks so highly of what God is doing here and what you folks are doing as you follow his leadership that it's, it's contagious, that kind of zeal and enthusiasm. And it makes you want to go and see exactly what's going on. And I am not one bit disappointed in what I see here because I sense God. That's the great thing. And the Lord is present. The Lord has great future for you. And I believe you're in a special place. You know, I like to be pastor where there's a lot of people. Because, uh, but it has its, uh, its challenges. If you're a small fish in a big pond, you, it's hard to really get that footing. I know what it is to be a big fish in a little pond. That's, a great, that's, a, that's an easy thing, really. But it, uh, you have a lot of influence. And, uh, but you are in a place where you can reach thousands of people, even in your own area. And we're seeing the same thing in Greenville. The 36 years I've been there, it's, Lord, it's, the, it's crazy the way the place is growing. I came from a place that had not issued a new house permit to be built in the past year. And ever since I've been in Greenville, I've never seen building. Every place that's vacant, it's sprawling out. And people are coming in and uh, uh, industry used to be the textile capital of the world, but it has shifted now. Corporate uh, offices are located there. The whole atmosphere has changed in that place, but needs a great revival and needs more Pentecostal churches with a full gospel who are there to reach that area. And the challenge is great, and it's... I'm, I have a heart for America. That's where I've been commissioned to preach. And my heart is grieved when I see what I see, hear what I hear in our country today. And I'm thinking that I don't know what the future holds. I know who holds the future. And I'm comfortable. I don't have any question about God. But I wonder about the direction that we're going in. We need, the church needs to be greater than ever and the world needs the church more than it's ever needed the church. And we want to be what God wants us to be. And as long as I live, my goal is to be involved in doing something to help and to encourage and to strengthen those who are going out. Now, having said that, I've got you at my text. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. It says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy. I could stop right there and preach on that, and I will talk about that in a minute. Let them be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the Scripture says, 
You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. And Father, we ask you to bless the reading of your word. And I believe you've spoken to my heart about this scripture. I'm comfortable with the scripture, but it's not an easy passage to take. And you've helped me, I believe. And now, Lord, I ask you, not so much what I've prepared, but what you would have spoken over these people today, that's what we want to be done. And so we ask you to anoint us to speak, anoint every person here to hear, and let this word be planted in our hearts today and forever bring fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I, we, we have, uh, I probably know uh, Bradley and Sidney. And I know Brad more than I do Sidney, but I've known him. And when I talk to my son, who is uh, one of the vice presidents, the executive vice president, in fact, at Southeastern College, He said, I mentioned Brad's name, and he said, I know him very much. He's a great guy. I don't know how you got him away from a lower state, but thank God he's still in the state, right? But we miss him. We miss him being closer to us, but it's still good. We've just got the devil between us. We're going to whoop him. (laughs) It's so good to be here, and Brother Ed and, and Christy and... You guys are special people. You're blessed with a great pastor, and I I commend you for that. But I want to talk to you about honor today. Honor, honor, honor. It's a great thing. And I remember our our district superintendent, as you probably are aware, died suddenly. And Vic and I were in Bible school together. I've known him for over 50 years. And uh, we've labored together, and he has helped me in ways that I wouldn't even be here today if it hadn't have been for his influence and him standing with me in various, some battles that I've gone through in, in, the, in ministry. But when he became superintendent, one of the things he talked to us about was creating a culture, a culture of honor. And I know this for a fact. He would visit retired ministers who were on their last leg and whose health was gone. And they were near that the door to enter into the next king, the kingdom. And he was one that would go and stop by and see these guys and ladies and pray with them. And Vic was a, was a giver. He never bragged about it. But he would personally give them some money. We've ate together so many times, and it took me a long time to discover that he was paying the bill and never turned the expense into the district. And I quit ordering the big steaks. <laughs> I said, I'm going to be a little more frugal because I had no idea that Vic was paying we roomed together two years ago at General Council in, in Anaheim. And it wasn't uncommon him to find the maid who cleaned our room and give her a $25 tip. He wasn't a wealthy man. He just had a heart of compassion. And he said, I want to cultivate honor, a culture of honor in the district. And that's what you're doing here today is cultivating a culture for your church. And it's not only toward your your leadership team, but it's toward every person who is involved from the least to the greatest who doesn't appreciate encouragement and those who recognize the work that they're doing and to have somebody speak into their life. I found this definition of honor that I love. It, it says it means to, to put value on and to uh, speak value into people's lives. When we honor people, we're saying we value you. We value what you bring to our life. 
We value what you make available to us. And I thought, that is exactly what we're talking about, and that's what this scripture is talking about. Honor those. Paul said to Timothy, as he went around and was appointing elders in the churches that were rising up quicker than they could prepare ministers for. And he said, honor those men that are in in these leadership positions. He wanted to create a culture of honor. And I believe that I believe that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation creates a culture of honor. I remember when I started in ministry in Greenville 37 years ago now, 1982. And I remember I I, I always was intrigued by Abraham, the man of faith, and what the New Testament had to say about him. And so I started, I did a study of Abraham's life. I expected to find a great man, but I didn't find a great man. I found a simple man with a great God. And I said, man, that's the same God I serve. And you don't have to have, listen, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. When God calls you, He gives you the gift. He gives you the anointing and enables you to do then what He has commissioned you to do. And so we never have to go in our own strength. We can always go in His strength. Isn't that wonderful? I, was, I was, got up one morning a couple of weeks ago and, you know, one of those mornings where you feel like a truck run over you. And I'm thinking, I don't know how long I can keep this schedule up. And all of a sudden, it came to me. He is my strength. He is my refuge. He is my fortress. And, all, and it was like strength just began to flow into my life. My shoulders raised up, and I said, yes, I can go in His strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do it. And so can you. It's not great people that God's looking for. It's those who are looking, who know him as a great God. And, the, and you know, the pastor under whose ministry I was saved, as far as I know, is probably dead today, but he was out of the ministry the last time I heard, had no idea what would happen in my life. And it was on a Sunday night. I don't remember what he preached. That always kind of disappoints me when people tell me this. Pastor, I don't remember what you preached, but I know what God said to me. And I know what God said to me that night. I was raised in church. I've never been out of church. I'm a third generation Pentecostal. My son's fourth generation. My grandkids are fifth generation And it started with my grandmother, who was saved under Brother Stanley's ministry. Amazing. Charles Stanley's grandfather was her pastor in a Pentecostal church. And she was saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. I pray he comes back to his Pentecostal roots. And he's talked about those before. But it's amazing. The pastor never knew, and you will never know the people that you are influencing until you stand that day in the city. And so this culture of of honor that we're talking about is a good thing. The first thing I would say about this passage is these men honored God. And you say, well, it doesn't even mention that in the passage. No, but the Bible does. In in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30, in the last part of that verse, here's what it says. God honors those who honor Him. God honors them. Let me tell you what I believe. I believe heaven has a culture of honor. I believe when Vic walked through those pearly gates, 
He was met with a delegation. He was welcome into the city. God is preparing a banquet for us. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And what, I, I know it's going to have Kentucky Fried Chicken there. <laughs> and chocolate cake. That's the two things that I'm sure of. They, are, they have to be from heaven. And I'm looking forward to it. But can't you just see God welcoming in and has a crown for us because we have been faithful to do what God has given us to do. Yes, God's all about honor. And I I pray this prayer often. Unto you, Lord, be all glory and what? Honor. I never thought about it. I honor him, but God honors those who honor him. The Bible says that give, bring the first fruits and give it to God of all your increase. Honor the Lord with your substance. And I believe in that. I believe everything that I have today belongs to God. I'm just a manager. And what I want to do is use it in a way that glorifies and honors the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a wonderful life, isn't it? I told someone, I just live from hand to mouth. His hand to my mouth. And that's a big hand, brother. God honors us so many ways. How many times has he done it? How many times? And so I know these men honored God. And when you honor God, God will honor you. We get, when we honor the word of God, it gives value to that word. In fact, I, I, am on, I read the Bible on you version, and every day my phone is dinging. It just about blows up. People in the church I pastored in Maryland for 30, for eight and a half years, young people that are now pastoring, many of them, and others that are believers and workers in the church, and it, they are talking about They just finished this Bible reading course and this course. You see, when I was in Southeastern University, it was college at that time, Bible college, and I was at First Assembly of God in Lakeland. The pastor in 1967 challenged us to read the Bible through. I'd never read the Bible through. I was 26 years old. If, I, if you asked me, do you believe the Bible? I'd say every word of it. I hadn't even read it. <laughs> I'd never read the Bible through a single time. And I started reading the Bible through in 1967. And he said to us college kids and a married man with two children and working and taking a full load at college, he said, You'll never have more time than you've got right now. I thought he was crazy. But now, 50-some years later, looking back, I'm saying he knew exactly what he was talking about. And I began to read the Bible through. And I've challenged others. Did you know if I love God's Word and honor God's Word, guess what my people find and catch? It's better caught than taught. They began to honor the Word. They began to read it. And here's what really got my attention as I was going through Bible school. First time I'd ever been in a a Pentecostal church with over 100 people in it. There was about 300 then in the church there. And it it was different. People saved every Sunday. We have two or three a year. We thought that was good. But here there's people coming in and being saved. But the thing that challenged me was, I said, they preach the word like they really believe it works. You want to know how to order your finances? What does the Bible say? You want to know how to have a good marriage? What does the Bible say? You want to know how to raise your kids? What does the Bible say? You want to know how to minister? What does the Bible say? 
This book will tell you how to live your life and do it in a way that God will honor you and bless you on every turn you take. He gives more than we deserve. He blesses us more than we could ever earn. And so when I read this scripture the first time, I honestly, I asked Brother Nelson, I said, I'm going to do this, preach on this, uh, the uh, Pastor Appreciation Day. What do you recommend that I do? And he sent me a verse back and said, give honor to those whom honor is due. I said, thank you very much. I wasn't expecting an outline because I don't know if Ed uses outlines or not. But that was good. But when I read the scripture, I was absolutely, here's the thought that came in and touched me. A warm, I know that feeling. When it's not just mine, God honors the leaders. God honors pastors just like he honors parents. And I felt it, and I said, that's it. And some are worthy of double honor. That's the culture, the culture of honor that we are seeking to foster and to feed. And you are doing a masterful job at it. The second thing I would say about this uh, passage is this. His, the ministry honored the Lord as well, what they were doing. He talks about those who rule well, those who preside over, the overseers. Paul said, take heed to yourself and to the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. I remember when I moved from being an associate pastor to a pastor, when I was an associate, I was anointed, but I wasn't anointed to pastor. And if God wanted the church to go in a certain direction, he wasn't going to tell me, he's going to tell this man. And sometimes people would complain about the pastor. I know there's none of those here. And they didn't like what was going on. They'd come in my office and they began to talk to me. And I'd say, you're in the wrong office. They said, what do you mean? I'm not the pastor, I said. Go down this hall, take this left turn, and the door at the end of that hall, that's where you need to be. Because you're talking to the wrong person. God hasn't anointed me to be the pastor of this church. But when I took my first church and I began to move into the thing that I really had a heart to do, I sensed a new anointing that God gave me for the job that was at hand. And I saw what God could do if you stay close to him. And he can take a pile of rubble and out of it bring up something that is majestic and God honoring out of it. We serve a mighty God. Their, their ministry was great. Now there are two things about the ministry that is mentioned here. One is their leadership. When I went through Southeastern back before Noah built the ark, there was not a single class on leadership. No one taught me anything about leadership. And I believe leadership is very important. But leadership has taken the forefront today. I think that's a mistake too. What, the, what, we, what we zeroed in on was you've got to have a personal, intimate relationship with God. You need to know God. You need to build your own life, and then you go from there in your ministry. But no, no teaching on leadership. But when you get leadership in its proper place, which is vitally important, leadership determines the number of people you pastor. Leadership is important. But when you get leadership and laboring in God's Word together, You've got a winning combination that will not only build a great work, but it will be a lasting work. And it will build, be built on a foundation that will not crumble. And so that's what I see in this passage. And I've been praying about this for a long time because I do 
truly. I've been in John Maxwell seminars, and I've read his books, and I, I have a master's degree in church leadership, and I'm glad for all of that. But you know what my pastor used to tell me? Get all the education you can, then forget it, get the Bible, and do what it tells you to do. And all the educators were angry with him. But that's good advice. Follow the book. You can never go wrong following this book and the Scripture. But labor is a good word for it. Now, I'm sure I was looking at the fixer-upper deal on your uh, website. If I'd have had time, I would have listened to one of your sermons. And then I'd have critiqued it this morning. <laughs> not, not really. I, it was very innovative. And I could say, man, they're doing something there. I like your website. But the, the, the thing is, that's not, labor is what it is. Labor. I look back now and I preach three times a week for, I don't know, umpteen years. How in the world do you get three completely different messages? If you, you know, the average sermon time, eight hours to, to, to produce a, a message. And sometimes it takes me longer. And like last night, I sat down and read my notes. You see, I got my notes all typed out. But what I'm preaching is what I scribbled on here after I read through them. I told my wife, I said, I can't preach that. She said, why can't you? I said, there's not enough Jesus in it. And if I'm not talking about Jesus, I'm not really preaching. And I can't do that. And so I went to bed. I said, I panicked. I'm preaching this morning. I said, what am I going to do? I have thousands of sermons. I got three file cabinets full of them in my office at home now. I don't have a sermon. I never did like to eat warmed over food. If you eat warmed over food, make sure you kill all the germs in it. Get it hot enough at killing all the germs. If you're preaching a warmed over sermon, make sure you got so much fire, nobody knows this has been preached before. <laughs> right? So I said, what am I going to do? Did you know, for years and years, at 3 o'clock in the morning, God talks to me. I said, Lord, couldn't you pick a better time? <laughs> I'm tired. And I woke up, and I, it, it was just like the Lord was saying, well, look, who is it to be honored? It's the man who is faithfully laboring in the Word. You know what I think about when labor comes? I think about a woman giving birth. And I often compare that. That's what it takes to get a sermon. You, you birth it. And you can do all your homework, have all your stuff neatly laid out. You look at it. You think, dear God, I can't preach that. And invariably, after I've prepared, I pray this prayer. Now, Lord, this is what I've prepared. I've done the best I know to do. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Please, I only want to say what you want me to say. I only want to preach that. Would you help me to hear what you are saying? And I heard God speaking to my heart about what I'm saying to you this morning and how that culture of honor is all through the Scripture. There's Abraham that God, God said he's my friend. There's Moses. God said, it, does anybody else talk to me face to face? I don't speak to him in dreams and visions. I talk to him face to face. Jabez, 
The only thing I know about him is the prayer he prayed. Enoch, as far as I know, wasn't a priest or anything. I don't know who he was. But he walked with God and was not because God took him to heaven with him. And then the New Testament. I would never have chosen Peter to be on my team. He had hoof and mouth disease. His great talent was open mouth and insert foot. He could speak when he should have been listening, sleep when he should have been praying. He was impetuous. He had a lot of things that said no. And then there's James and John. Can't you see their mother going in and saying, I want to ask you a favor? Yes, what is it? I want one son to sit on this side and the other to sit on that side. Isn't that just like a mother? No, I would not chose them either. I'd say the mother's too strong. I don't want to have to deal with that. But these are people that God took. And listen, Peter, when I read his book, I can see the experience of his denial of Christ as it comes out in it. He doesn't talk about it directly, but you can see what he learned through that about being steadfast, unmovable, being strong in God. God honors those men. God has given us a chapter that is called the Heroes of the Faith. In the book of Genesis, of Hebrews chapter 11, where person after person is listed and their faith is immortalized, he honors them. He honors them. I don't think I'm going to stand with the Moses in heaven, nor will I stand with one of the apostles. Some people talk about, I want to run up and fall at his feet. I think I'm going to stand back in the fringe. Because I'm going to be saying, Lord, I'm not worthy. You see, I was raised in a family. I have never heard my father criticize a pastor. He's dead now. Never one time. We never had pastor for lunch. I don't mean we didn't invite him over. We did. But when he wasn't there, we didn't talk about him. I had such a... Missionaries and pastors was so high in my estimation that when I knew God had called me in the ministry and somehow the word had gotten out and I was in a meeting, all the pastors were on the platform and they had me to come up and sit with them and that was the hardest thing I've ever done because inside I cringed. I said, I'm not worthy. Who am I to be sitting here with these men? But God makes us worthy. God is looking to immortalize, to inscribe us in the annals of heaven. And when we get there, what's he going to do? He's going to begin to reward you for your faithful work. I am absolutely sure my little grandmother had no education but had a relationship with God. When she died, she didn't get enough uh, Social Security to feed a a mouse. But they found she was supporting pastors all over the place. She was sending a little offering to them every month. The last time I was with her, My two brothers were with me. One of them is in ministry, pastors in Atlanta. The other's been involved in ministry in various ways. But we were, we went to visit Grandma Owen. And she got to talking about the Lord. And finally we had to go, so we got in a little circle. And Grandma didn't weigh 90 pounds, I'm sure. She was standing there, and we all held hands. We began to pray. Spirit of God came upon her. Pretty soon, I had I watch and pray. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? I kept my eyes open. I was looking down. I saw her feet starting to move. Next thing I know, she was laying on the floor, speaking in tongues. 
When she got up, she said, you know, I can't even talk to my children like I can talk to you. And she looked at me right in the eye. She said, Ken, are you preaching the truth? Yes, ma'am. Wasn't long before she asked me again, three or four times, are you preaching the truth? Yes, ma'am. My grandmother is the beginning of what is happening in my life. I preached her funeral along with my other brother. We preached it together. One statement I said, I didn't even live in the same town she lived in. From nine years of age on, I only saw her two or three times a year. Every single time we went home to see grandmother spend the night, when we got there, her Bible was open. She was sitting by the old warm morning heater to stay warm in the kitchen. And I looked at that Bible, and it was filled with tear stains, some of them fresh. She had been praying and weeping before God. And it, I said, this woman has had the greatest impact on my life of any single person. She has a special place, but so do you. God honors those who honor him. If the book is finished. And let me just say this as I close. I, I, I've lost track. Oh, I probably have gone way too long. Excuse me. They told me to take all the time I wanted. <laughs> Angela told me. She gave me permission. First time I went overseas, I went to India. The first place we went through Hong Kong and spent, uh, we'd flown all night, actually. And we lost a day going because you passed the international date line. And we were wiped out, but we wanted to go around and visit uh, Hong Kong, see what it was like, and we did. We flew into Calcutta, India, first place I ever landed in India. And uh, when I got off the plane with the uh, uh, rest of my folks, we had a number. I think, uh, I think Burbacher was with us on that trip. And uh, we were riding from the airport to the hotel. I saw what looked like ants, huge mound, and ant looked like ants crawling all over it. And when we got close enough, what I discovered it was, it was a trash dump covered with people looking for a bite of food. I, I had such culture shock that I actually got sick. I'd never, I've seen poverty. We grew up poor, but we didn't know it. We never talked about that because God always provided for us. We were flying back home after spending two weeks in India and doing pastor schools and, and et cetera. And then we were in Bangkok, Thailand, and we had just, Gone to a little tour of that city, and there is an emerald Buddha in Bangkok. And we went in. You have to take your shoes off to go in. You go in where the monks are speaking in tongues. It's not the real thing. They don't believe in Jesus. They have a different religion. It's the darkest place I've ever been in the world. That night... I've gone through two time zones. I'm completely burned out. And we're leaving the next morning for 30 hours of travel, including airport time, to get back home. We left on Friday morning, flew 30 hours, and got home Friday evening because we went back over the international date line. And I'm standing on the 37th floor of that hotel looking out over Bangkok, weeping. What do I do with what I've seen? 
Do I go back and live like I didn't see it? Do you want me to go as a missionary? What do I do? How can I process this? I can never be the same again. And I decided, Lord, if you don't send me, I'm going to be a missionary's friend. And I'm going to help every missionary that I possibly can to get to their field of ministry so that we can reach this world. Did you know 12 million people live in Calcutta, land mass the size of the Dallas-Fort Worth airport? Mark Buntain had been there for years. He died there, was buried there. We were there for the dedication of the new church he just built. The only new church had ever been built in the place. And I'm told that he, was, he would be visiting someone and they would talk about India. And he would fall on his face and begin to weep. Weeping. My question is, can so few give so much when so many give so little? When we stand before God, we're not taking anything that we've amassed here. The only thing we'll have there is what we've sent on. And my heart is, reach as many as you possibly can before it's too late. And I believe that's the pastor's heart. It's the heart that God has given. You know what the Bible says? He's approved us as messengers. And Paul said, I, I speak as a one who's been approved by God and entrusted with the gospel. Every one of us have been entrusted with the gospel. What will we do with that? How will we fulfill God's plan for our lives? What will we do? It's not too late. You have a wonderful place, a home base, to reach out and to do a marvelous work. <laughs>